My name is Jorge Meneses, and I am the president, uh, current president of the EERI San Diego Regional Chapter. And also I am a member of the ERI Board of Directors. On behalf of ERI San Diego Chapter, thank you, thank you very much uh, to the speakers for uh, making possible this webinar and also to all of you for attending and participating in this uh, webinar. We are going to have first uh, Tasnim Sadiq, um, a member of the regional board here in San Diego, who is going to make some announcements. And then we are going to have the two speakers who will speak back to back. And then after the presentation by the speakers, we are going to have a session for questions and answers. Uh, if you are interested, uh, in making a question or making a comment, please raise your hand. At the bottom of your screen, there is an icon on reactions. So you can click on reactions and then you will see an option for raising hand, raise hand. So do that and then I will, we will ask you to uh, state your question. Also another possibility is to use the chat option at the bottom. Click on chat and type your question or comment, and then we will address that, okay? So just keep in mind these two options if you want to make any questions or comments at the end or during the presentation, but we are going to address, respond the questions and address the comments at the end of the two presentations, all right? So again, thank you very much for joining today. So Tasni. Thank you, Dr. Manessas, and thank you everyone again for attending our webinar today. Just a few announcements to go over. It should take too long. Uh -oh. There we go. First off, 2022 is just around the corner. Can you believe it? That means, though, that Engineers Week is coming. It will be from February 20th through the 26th. Now, the San Diego County Engineering Council hosts events throughout that week ending it with an award ceremony. Do you know anyone deserving of recognition? Well, if you live in San Diego, you can nominate people for various engineering honor awards. And the deadline for that is next Friday. Next up is a save the date for our next Kenji Ishihara Colloquium. This time the focus will be on challenges from climate change to earthquake resilience, and it's set for August, 2022. Eight, eight months advance notice. Mm -hmm. So be on the lookout for more information on that over the next several months, and we look forward to seeing you there. And finally, if you're not a member of EERI yet, I encourage you to consider joining. That way you'll be in the know about opportunities and benefits such as attending events like these for a discount or for no fee at all and then getting to mingle and network with other professionals and educators in the field. And if there's any students out there, this is great for you guys too. Yeah. Plus, remember the pre-COVID days when we had food? Yeah, we're gonna have that back too eventually. Uh, if you don't wanna pay the full national membership price, you can certainly try out the local chapter membership for $25. And you can check us out more at our website, as well as our social media profiles over on Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn. Just search EERISD. That does it for announcements. Back to you, Dr. Manessas. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Tasnim. So now we are going to start with uh, our first presentation. Um, Professor Wills, please you can start sharing your screen. Professor Christopher Wills is a professor emeritus of biological sciences at UC San Diego. Born, born in England, Christopher Wills grew up in Canada. From 1972 until his retirement in 2010, he was associate and full professor of biology at the University of California, San Diego. He was the first to deliberately select for genetic variants in enzymes. 
He has explored the roles of genetic recombination in the maintenance of genetic variation in Drosophila and yeast, and the role of microsatellite DNA variation in the evolution of diseases and the evolution of our species. Most recently, he has organized a large group of ecologists from around the world to apply new analytical methods to the forces that are maintaining variation in complex ecosystems, such as rainforests and coral reefs. He has written eight books for the general public on evolution and ecology. In 1999, he received the award for public understanding of science and technology from the American Association for the Advancement of Science. My great pleasure and a great honor to introduce to you, Professor Christopher Wills. Well, thank, thank you very much, Jorge, and thanks for that very kind introduction. And uh, I'd like to thank the organizers of this meeting to, to, uh, who were, uh, invited me. I, I'm a little bit under the radar, I think, for people, simply because I'm not a, uh, an engineer, but I'm very anxious to learn how engineers look at this question of um, punctuated equilibrium and how some of the things that we can learn about how evolution works might possibly be apply applicable to uh, to how uh, we can start to build some resilience into the engineering framework that uh, that we're all about to start constructing, I guess. Um, but I, what I'm going to do in this little talk is simply to sort of bring you up to speed or try to on uh, how what punctuated equilibrium is and how the idea of it has changed, and in particular, how our understanding of the prevalence of punctuated equilibrium in the fossil record uh, has changed over time. Simply, of course, because we're constantly changing, uh, understanding more and more about how evolution works. We're understanding more and more about the, the way in which the fossil record has been laid down and where the gaps are in the fossil record and, and how we can interpolate into those gaps to see what's really going on. So punctuated equilibrium then is an idea that was proposed originally by uh, Niles Eldridge and Stephen Jay Gould. So in 1972, Eldridge and Gould introduced this term punctuated equilibrium. They wanted to describe uh, the patterns that one sees in the fossil record. And in particular, they were struck by the fact that if you look at the fossil record at a particular time in the past, so many million years ago, you'll see a collection of species that were alive at that time. You certainly won't see all of them, but you'll see some, um, depending on the, on the nature of the, of the deposit that you're looking at, how well preserved it is, uh, what kinds of creatures got preserved, and so on. So you get these little snapshots of the world in the past. And what struck them was that if you look at a snapshot of say uh, 100 million years ago, and another snapshot at 90 million years ago, the species tend to largely to have disappeared and been replaced by other species. And they initially assumed that what must be happening is that there should be some longish period of time during which the species on the earth don't change very much. And then some punctuation takes place, some change in the environment, uh, some set of conditions alter, such that these species are replaced by a new set of species. And in general, they call this punctuated equilibrium. You have these periods, long periods of equilibrium, punctuated by rapid change. And this really goes back to some of the early uh, geologists trying to understand the, the fossil record, uh, who were talking about um, gradualism versus catastrophism, a period of catastrophic changes in the past, bringing about big changes, or uh, did most of the past exist in, a, in a, an era at a time of gradualism when change was much slower? So what they did essentially was bring this old gradualist catastrophist idea up to date and put and gave it the name of punctuated equilibrium. Well, now 
as we learn more and more about how species appear and how species change into other species, how some species disappear and new species arise in their place. We realize that many groups of organisms have managed to get right through some of these very severe changes that have happened in the past. And some of these changes, the so-called uh, uh, mass extinctions, were very severe indeed, wiping out large numbers of species in a relatively short period of time. So a lot of species have managed to survive even these severe events. And on top of that, many different ways of extinction have taken place throughout periods where nothing much appears to have changed. That appearance of change may be illusory. We may in fact be missing a lot of localized changes in the environment that may bring about little bursts of evolution. We also know that major extinction events do indeed put a severe stress on the entire world. Uh, uh, in the case of, let's say, the, the, uh, the asteroid impact that wiped out the dinosaurs 66 million years ago, that impact changed the climate of the planet dramatically. The entire planet was altered by this gigantic uh, uh, impact event and perhaps by the volcanic eruptions followed it. So these major extinction events really can be extremely severe. But Darwinian evolution is, is capable of surviving even the most severe extinctions. Obviously, if they're so severe that the most multicellular life is wiped out, then of course all bets are off. We don't know what the world's going to be like then. But for the most part, even the <laughs> excuse me, like me. Um, even the major events don't really have a huge effect on, on, uh, on the composition of species. So Darwinian evolution enables life to recover from these stresses and to allow living organisms to take new directions, even without there being immense environmental disasters. Sometimes these changes can happen even in the absence of such disasters. On top of that, because the fossil record is not that well known even now, Tom Schaff pointed out that what you're looking at is a series of like flash pictures as if people took a, 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 the old fashioned camera with a flash gun and blasted a picture of the earth as it was at a certain time. And then uh, one comes back some millions of years later and, and you take a snapshot of the same thing because the conditions have to be just right in order for, the, for, for a reasonable number of fossils to be preserved and to be preserved under conditions where the fossils are relatively intact. And when Gould and Eldridge looked at this pattern, they thought that what you had, because of these flash pictures, these periodic flash pictures, they were thinking that much of the time between the, the flash pictures, not much changed. But in fact, we now know that species lifetimes may be much shorter and they may be continuously being replaced rather than an overall pattern of punctuated equilibrium. Schopp sort of diagrammed this. He suggested that uh, one could have uh, a pattern of punctuated equilibrium here if this is time in this direction, and this is species diversity in this direction. Then what you can have, have is a, a family tree of species with bursts of change happening here. All these horizontal lines show these bursts of change and new species appear at these junctions. These are little areas of punctuation uh, and they are interspersed with periods of equilibrium. But a lot of what the pattern that you appear to see in the fossil record may be an artifact because you're not seeing a continuous picture here. You can see seeing a series of, of flash pictures that uh, can happen at any point in time, in any part of the planet, you can get a, a, a sudden picture of what's going on. And see, it's as if you're watching a movie and virtually all the frames in the movie were deleted. So you just see the occasional frame. Instead, he suggested uh, that probably evolution looks rather more like this. There's a much more gradual set of changes with new species appearing along these different branches. You'll get the same diversity of species perhaps at the end, but the root 
that you got uh, to this point involved many more speciation events, many more extinctions happening down these different lineages and happening as a result of, of relatively small events, perhaps. So obviously, uh, the truth lies somewhere in between these two pictures. Some years later, Krug and Jablonski tried to correct for this. They looked at some of the best fossils that we've got, the marine bivalves, and we have lots and lots of beautiful marine bivalve fossils, oysters, clams, mussels, etc. And they looked at these in terms of um, groups of species and groups of, of genera, collections of species that could be identified in the fossil record. Easy to do with bivalves. They're beautifully preserved in the fossil record, usually with a lot of detail, so you can see all the details of the creatures that lived back then. And then they looked at the proportion of originations in these different groups. Here we have two graphs. This graph shows what happened during the latter part of the Mesozoic. This is the end of the age of dinosaurs that you see coming through here. The time is going in this direction. This is the present here. We're going back to, uh, say, on the order of 200 million years ago. And this uh, time period then, what you can do is look at present day groups of bivalves and follow them back through time. And at first, most of the groups are present 100%, you see all the current species. But as you go further back in time, eventually you begin to lose species because species are originating at some point in time. So that at some point, let's say somewhere around here, this particular group that's been followed, uh, all the members of the group back here were still, are still present at the present time. But uh, as you go further back, you find fewer and fewer of these groups. And following further back, what you do is hit the big extinction event, which happened 66 million years ago, and which wiped out the dinosaurs and a lot of other creatures. And you can ask what happens to all these present day groups as they go backwards through this extinction event. Well, a couple of interesting things happen. First of all, the rate continues to decline. You still have a lot of members of these groups surviving this big extinction event, but there is a drop here. Definitely, you're losing some of these groups. In fact, it seems to be a rather complicated and interesting drop here. That could be an artifact, I don't know. But um, then when you get back into the latter part of the age of dinosaurs, you go once again, getting this sort of linear uh, process in which you're losing uh, species and losing genera at a pretty constant rate as you move further back in time. What is fascinating here is that it would appear that after the extinction of dinosaurs and the rise of the mammals, evolution seems to have sped up. There is a tendency for these groups of species to survive for uh, essentially uh, shorter periods of time as you go further back here. The, the turnover is in fact increased as we go back. The turnover during the latter part of the age of dinosaurs is much slower. Then if we go further back in time, we can see a similar sort of pattern. What we see here is over here, we've got essentially the, the end of the age of dinosaurs. This is essentially the point at which the dinosaurs went extinct. And moving further back, you hit two major mass extinction events. One here at the boundary between uh, the, um, at the beginning of the Mesozoic, um, the, uh, the boundary that essentially uh, separates the first of the three great periods in the Mesozoic from each other. There was a fairly large extinction that happened here. And here at the boundary between the age of dinosaurs and the huge period of time before that, there was a really massive extinction event, the biggest one that we know about. So you can start with using the fossil record. You can start with groups of organisms. Let me get rid of this little band. You can see that there's a pretty constant 
rate of decline here in the proportion of origination as you go back in time. And then uh, there is a little bit of a change here. They think that they've had an effect, but it wasn't huge. And then if you go further back, you get this really big extinction event, which did have a big effect. It certainly sped up the rate of evolution. So you can tell a lot from this. You can tell that all the time in between these major extinction events, there's a turnover of species all the time. And at the present time, we can see this too. I'm running out of time, I think. Um, if we look here at the lakes of East Africa, the Great Lakes and the Great Rift Valley of East Africa, this is the part of Africa that is, uh, a lot of it is actually below sea level. It's uh, in the process, this whole piece of Africa is splitting off from the rest of Africa. And this process is producing a lot of low lying valleys, which fill up with water. So these big lakes in particular, Lake Victoria, Lake Tanganyika, Lake Malawi, these lakes um, have very different evolutionary histories. They're all recent for the most part, relatively recent. Uh, Tanganyika is a few million years old. Lake Victoria has filled and emptied a number of times. The last time it was completely dry, it's a big, big lake, but it's very shallow. The last time it was completely dry was at the height of the last age, ice age, about 14,000 years ago. Then it began to fill up as the ice age uh, began to change and the glaciers retreated. More rainfall hit, and as a consequence, you get more rain growing, uh, falling here in East Africa. So this lake is really quite young, 14,000 years old. If you look at the cichlid fish, these are little mouth breeding fish, many, many species of these fish that live in the lakes. And huge amounts of effort, uh, only Seenhausen and many other people have really spent their lives examining the incredible explosion of species that exists in these different lakes. And it's possible, as you can see here, to build a kind of family tree of the different groups of species. You can see some of the huge variety of species here. And what you find is that in the fish of Lake Victoria, which are represented a bunch over here, the fish of Lake Victoria, there are hundreds of species of fish at the present time, but they all originated very, very recently. As you can see, the tree that leads to these Lake Victoria fish has very shallow roots, whereas the tree that leaks, to, and the same thing with Lake Malawi, but the tree that leads the tree that leads to the fish that live in the other lakes is much, much deeper. Uh, so this tree, it turns out, if you look at the DNA that's involved in these, these fish, you find that these hundreds of species of fish literally appeared over the last 14,000 years. None of the fish in Lake Victoria are much older than 14,000 years. The ancestors of these fish came in from the rivers that surround the lake. Um, and they, col they colonized the lake as soon as it appeared and they rapidly speciated. And the reason they do now, we know now, is because these fish brought with them pools of genetic variation from the fish in the other lakes and the fish in the older lakes. They brought with them pools of genetic variation, which could very quickly be sorted out and selected to produce the enormous variety of fish here. So over 400 different species of fish appearing in Lake Victoria over a mere 14,000 years. This indicates to, I think, the majority of evolutionary biologists that speciation is, is, is highly dynamic. That speciation can grow like crazy given the opportunity, given the, the right environmental conditions, given the right pools of genetic variability, wow, you can simply take speciation uh, in, in an explosive direction, producing many, many different species. So punctuated equilibrium uh, had its uses in the past in the sense that it really got people to think about the details of the fossil record. But we're now looking at that record and seeing a lot more information. And I think the story has turned out to be quite an exciting one. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor uh, Wills. So <clears throat> uh, please stop sharing your screen.
And then Professor O'Rourke will start uh, setting up his slides. So prof our next speaker will be Professor uh, Thomas O'Rourke. Uh, Professor uh, Thomas O'Rourke is a Thomas R. Briggs Professor of Engineering Emeritus in the School of Civil and Environmental Engineering at Cornell University. He's a member of the US National Academy of Engineering, distinguished member of the American Society of Civil Engineers, international fellow of the Royal Academy of Engineering, member of the Mexican Academy of Engineering, and a fellow of the American Association for the Advancement of Science. He authored or co-authored over 410 technical publications and has received numerous awards for his research. His interests cover geotechnical engineering, earthquake engineering, underground construction technologies, engineering for large geographically distributed systems, and geographic information technologies and database management. It is my great pleasure and privilege to introduce to you Professor Thomas O'Rourke. Okay, um, thank you very much. Um, first of all, I wanna thank Jorge for a, a lovely introduction and also Chris, an excellent lecture. I learned a lot. It was wonderful to hear somebody talk about punctuated equilibrium who really knows the fossil record and that's terrific, thank you. So I wanna talk about punctuated resilience, which is borrowed directly from the concepts related to uh, punctuated equilibrium. And uh, I'm going to use uh, hurricanes as an example of how some uh, extreme events may occur, which change the nature of the way in which we protect the environment, particularly the built environment. So this is the first slide. And I will go to the second one. Okay, I have uh, taken a picture of the uh, Wall Street and William Street right in front of the stock exchange uh, from the 1920s where you can see a, a lot of, of infrastructure that's buried. And I have faded it to talk a little bit about these uh, particular subjects in terms of the background. Uh, you can see the, uh, the systems uh, in front of the stock exchange. Um, I'm going to talk about punctuated equilibrium very briefly, uh, some is aspects about global hazards, uh, the World Trade Center disaster in Hurricane Katrina, Hurricane Sandy, and, and finally a little commentary about the L-Line tunnel. Um, to start with, we are looking at the concept of punctuated equilibrium, which was advanced by Niles Eldridge and Stephen Jay Gould. Stephen Jay Gould was a very famous paleontologist. He was uh, actually the president of uh, the American Advancement uh, Association for the Advancement of Science. He had 479 peer-reviewed papers. He wrote 22 books, and, uh, and he is uh, accredited with over 300 essays, very famous essayist. Uh, his concept of, of punctuated equilibrium with Niles Eldridge was the creation, as we've learned from Chris's talk, uh, the new species occurs in rapid bursts rather than the slow constant rate over millions of years as proposed by Darwin. Um, he wrote a number of books. One of them is called A Wonderful Life. It's a takeoff on the movie of the same name uh, where he looks at uh, evolution uh, as being contingent upon the evolution of many other species. And uh, he looks at this burst of evolutionary change that occurs uh, in the uh, fossils in the Burgess Shale. And this goes back to the Cambrian uh, transformations. And, and he con looks at this as the Burgess Shale becoming a centerpiece for controlling the power of contingencies, the contingencies of other species and the absence of other species as affecting evolution through time. And he looks actually it's as a wonderful life where one man's uh, example affects many other people. And uh, he looks at uh, the wonderful life of Homo, homo sapiens as, as occurring as a um, transition through time 
and, uh, and one which is affected uh, by this uh, equilibrium situation. I think the most important takeaway from the punctuated equilibrium uh, comes from some comments from Niles Eldridge, where he comments that punctuated equilibrium has become a, a sort of a go-to uh, phrase for describing change within all kinds of systems uh, where change is sudden rather than gradual. So as a concept, it permeates the culture. Uh, it's something that, that goes away from, or shall we say independently of the original equilibrium and the study of the fossil record, and one which um, is applied to any kind of system that changes primarily through rapid bursts. And what I'm going to show is if we take a look at resilience, and resilience we'll define as the uh, ability uh, to absorb shocks or disruptions in the built environment and to um, accommodate changing situations. But if we look at this as a definition, the resilience really has generated itself with uh, certain extreme events and I'm going to try to illustrate that by focusing on uh, hurricanes. So we'll talk very briefly about global hazards. Um, we live in a pretty dynamic world. The world changes because there's population changes. Uh, and those population changes are superimposed on a dynamism associated with the crust of the earth that, uh, that really is about the same from year to year. But the population is not the same from year to year. We can see that there is a population versus year. And by 2050, we're projecting over nine and a half billion people. And those people are moving into areas that are susceptible to earthquakes. The Sea of Mamara is a great example where a lot of Turkish development is occurring along the Northern Anatolia Fault. And as a consequence, when we do have an event on the Northern Anatolia Fault, according to the co relatively constant event of dynamic effects, it has a much more dramatic impact on the populations which occur. Uh, we also live in an earth where there is climate change and that climate will contribute to temperature rises and those temperature rises not only will affect the temperature of the ocean, but they will cause greater and more frequent storms uh, that are generated by virtue of, of the temperatures that occur in the water. And if we look at some of the projections for year 2100, we have an increase in average temperatures that might go anywhere from, let's say, two to four degrees centigrade. And it's been the subject of quite a lot of discussion recently. Uh, if we take a look uh, at the disaster du jour, so we look at the 10 year interval from about 2014 to about 2013, we have these uh, extreme events occurring. Uh, of these, we have the 2004 Sumatra Andaman earthquake and tsunami, and this is the third largest earthquake ever recorded. We have the Tohoku earthquake and tsunami. This is the fourth largest earthquake ever recorded. And we have the 2010 Maui earthquake, which is the sixth largest earthquake ever recorded. And not only do we have a significant destruction of infrastructure associated with each of these events, uh, we also have events creating, strangely enough, in areas where there isn't a lot of built infrastructure, a lot of deaths associated with these events, almost 230,000 dead alone associated with the 2004 uh, Sumatra Andaman earthquake and tsunami. Uh, we can also look at disaster du jour in any particular year. So if we look at the year 2017, uh, we have these particular events which occurred during that period of time. And if we isolate some of the hurricanes that occurred then, Hurricane Harvey, Irma, uh, and Maria, we see that there is a tremendous amount of direct cost associated with these events. Hurricane Harvey is almost tied uh, with Hurricane Katrina at a cost of about $125 billion. Hurricane Irma, which affected Florida, is $50 billion. And Maria, which had a dramatic impact on Puerto Rico. And this is a picture of the lights out before the, earth, before the hurricane, excuse me, 
and after the hurricane. And, uh, and uh, we can see that there was a tremendous impact on the electrical power system, uh, a, a, a relationship with the society that is still being studied since the electricity for that particular island wasn't necessarily restored for over a hundred, uh, excuse me, 300 days after the event. Of course, with Hurricane Harvey, we had tremendous flooding. Uh, the hurricanes parked themselves over the Houston area, uh, and there were locations where there was over 40 to 50 inches per hour, that were, inches total that falled, uh, fell on the, uh, the ground, and, and there were many locations in these floodplains where people had to evacuate for maybe the third or the fourth time. Um, if we take a look at the nature of these disasters and the impact that they've had in terms of creating programs to master resilience against some of these disasters, we could trace a, a very important effect from the World Trade Center disaster to Hurricane Katrina. On September 11th, um, this was a changed everything in, in terms of how people live in the United States. Uh, September the 11th uh, led to what we might call the policy of protection of critical infrastructure, where there was a new department that was uh, created, the Department of Homeland Security, uh, and there was an effort on the part of, of people in the United States to protect critical infrastructure by making information, by making various uh, factors of that infrastructure very hard to acquire, certainly hard to acquire from people who wanted to destroy it, but also hard to, to acquire for people who wanted to help it. Um, we continued with this protection of critical infrastructure until um, Hurricane Katrina, where there was a change in the policy to resilient communities. And to this day, there's still a tension that exists in the United States. There's a direct uh, result of, of this resilience associated with September 11th, associated with Hurricane Katrina, where we have policy that's generated by protecting critical infrastructure and policy that's generated by creating resilient communities. And, uh, and there is still uh, a lack of a common uh, protocol where you would be able to balance the need to know against the need to secure. Um, if we look at hurricanes and their dramatic impact uh, in terms of particular events which cause changes to make various communities resilient, in 2005, there were many, many important hurricanes. Emily, Katrina, Rita, Wilma, in Mexico alone, there was Wilma and Emily, which caused great destruction. There was the problem associated with Katrina and Rita. Katrina, which was a direct hit on New Orleans, and, and Rita, which was very close in time and very close in location. And if we were to summarize in these hurricanes, there were about 28 named storms. 15 of these were hurricanes, over $180 billion of direct damages, quite significant. Uh, if we look at 2020, there was a similar kind of hurricane event where we ended up having 30 named storms, 13 of these were hurricanes, second only to uh, what we saw in 2005, and, and moreover significant events in terms of IOTA and ADA, uh, which were affecting locations close to Nicaragua uh, and destroying the electrical utility uh, systems uh, for those for that those countries which were affected by the hurricanes. Uh, in 2021, just recently, we had Hurricane Ida. Uh, this is tied with Sandy for the four, fourth most expensive hurricane on record, and it generates the costs of over $65 billion. And uh, we shut in the entire production of the Gulf of Mexico. And there was extensive flooding in, in New York and New Jersey, which was different from Hurricane Sandy because Hurricane Sandy actually involved the increase in the sea level. The water came up in an amazing surge, and that caused extensive flooding, whereas the Hurricane Ida turned into storms, which caused tremendous rainfall and a different kind of canalization of the water towards 
different uh, flooding uh, outlets. And some of these ravines and filled in valleys ended up flooding some apartments, particularly apartments which were below ground and, and killing some of the people in these apartment complexes. So uh, this is the third largest hurricane season uh, where there were 21 uh, storms that occurred. Seven of these became hurricanes. Well, this brings us then to how uh, hurricanes act as a changer of events. Clearly, these are catastrophic. And where they occur in particular locations, they have long-lasting effects. There's a punctuation associated with people's response to the various hurricanes. And as a consequence, the resilience that these extreme events create become punctuated by the actual events themselves, where there is a takeoff in some of the resilient activities to mitigate the effects of these extreme events in the future. Um, Hurricane Sandy resulted in about $65, $68 billion of property losses. Wall Street was shut down for a couple of days. There was direct flooding, uh, record flooding, mostly from the surge related to this hurricane and a direct hit. And, and the fact that it got into the upper Northeast part of the United States was also a revelation that added to the vulnerability from the Gulf states and the Atlantic states. And literally Hurricane Sandy changed America's, at that time, sort of favorite hazard. Instead of earthquakes, it became hurricanes. Both are very important, and I'll end this talk with some comments about uh, earthquakes that might affect uh, Southern California. If we take a look at hurricanes in the Northern Hemisphere, they spin counterclockwise. And typically, they come parallel to the coastline in the Northeast. Once they get that far north, they tend to go parallel with little penetration inside. And there is a storm surge that's created by these tangential winds. You can see that the wind comes off these rotational vortices and they will pick up the level of the water and bring it on shore. What happened during Hurricane Sandy, and that's why it's called Superstorm, is that there was another storm that was moving from east to west. It sucked in this particular rotational mass so that we had a velocity of the center and a tangential velocity of the sides, which were added to each other. And so there was even a, a greater surge event. And that surge event was actually amplified uh, by the topographical effects that are particular to New York. The hurricane literally was dragged on shore at just about uh, the Hudson River and the Harbor of New York. If we take a look at the southern part of Manhattan, lower Manhattan, uh, we have uh, a, uh, a hydrograph uh, that occurred there. This is the hydrograph from the night of Hurricane Sandy. And what you can see is the height of the water as a function of time. You can see the hurricane coming in uh, on Monday, uh, October the, the 29th. But prior to that, there is a fluctuation in the water level associated with plus or minus uh, four feet, which is the tide. And the tide came in at exactly when the surge came in. So if we subtract two feet from the 14 feet, which was measured, we actually get the real surge, about 12 feet of surge, on which was superimposed uh, the actual um, uh, tidal effects leading to a greater amount of water in New York. Now, this is a Landsat image. This was used uh, many times by FEMA uh, in terms of creating a model for the flooding of the metropolitan area in New York and, uh, and the effects that they had to try to treat on an emergency basis. This is the um, Landsat image before the hurricane. Uh, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to take that 14 feet of surge and I'm just going to superimpose it on this Landsat image. And you can see the tremendous amount of flooding that occurred in the New York City and New Jersey area. Uh, there's the battery. Um, we actually saw the, the hydrograph from the battery. There was a complete flooding at LaGuardia Airport. And if we zoom in to the lower part of Manhattan, 
and we superimpose that surge there, we see that these particular locations around Manhattan were underwater, um, close to the Brooklyn Bridge on either side, Brooklyn and, and Manhattan. There's the battery again. The World Trade Center was completely underwater. Um, the L-Line tunnel, which we'll talk about in a minute, was uh, completely inundated by the event. Uh, and, uh, and there was a, a Broad Street, which was completely underwater too. And at the World Trade Center, you had one of the central offices for New York, the Verizon Central Office, uh, which supplied all uh, of the information to Wall Street for the stock change uh, trading. Uh, and, and that was down by two days because uh, of, of the flooding that occurred. They actually brought the, the generators from the basement onto the um, uh, ninth or 10th story. Uh, but unfortunately, they, they left the um, fuel uh, down at the fifth level because of fire requirements. And as a consequence, uh, floatsum and jetsum broke and battered the fuel line so that there was no fuel that actually could get up to uh, the actual generators. Uh, and in about two days, they actually brought fuel to that street location brought it up to the generators and, and actually supplied electricity, which restarted uh, uh, the, the central office for Verizon. They had a backup central office, which was at Broad Street. Unfortunately, that was totally inundated. It took uh, many months, uh, maybe a year or two years to restore that at a cost of about a billion dollars. Okay, if we take a look at any system like the rapid transit system of New York, and we take the area that is underwater and uh, we fade this so that we have a transparency, you can see that a lot, or, lot of water went into South Ferry Station. The South Ferry Station had just been rehabilitated with about $60 million of rehabilitation and the surge of 14 feet went 14 feet over the entrance to uh, South Ferry Station all the way down to the subgrade for the trains in that station at about 60 feet of depth. And the water therefore spread out into many of the adjacent tunnels which are interconnected, that distance horizontally to be able to equilibrate with the 60 feet at, uh, at South Ferry Station. And that meant that a lot of tunnels were flooded as a consequence of the inundation from Hurricane Sandy. So if we take a look at these flooded tunnels, we have seven subway tunnels. We have the Brooklyn Battery Tunnel, the Midtown Tunnel, the Path Tunnels, the Holland Tunnel, the Amtrak East and the Amtrak North. Notice that the rail tunnels are listed in almost everyone's listing as a single tunnel. But each rail tunnel has an inbound tube and an outbound tube. So there are independent inbound and outbound tunnels associated with each of these rail tunnels. There's 10 rail tunnels and 20 when we take inbound and outbound, plus three for the vehicular traffic tunnels. So there's 23 physically distinct tunnels that are flooded as a consequence of Hurricane Sandy. And of course, we don't have to disrupt uh, a network very significantly than to have an effect on the entire network which is what happened uh, during uh, the hurricane event. And finally, we'll take a look at the flooding that occurred in uh, lower Manhattan and the effect that, it, that affected this Con Edison 138 KV substation located on uh, 14th Street. Um, and uh, they had a wall to protect it against inundation. That wall was 12 feet high. Unfortunately, with the tide, the surge was 14. And that meant that the water came in, caused an explosion uh, of the transformers. You can see that transformer explosion on YouTube still. They're, they're still existing on the internet. You can see this. Uh, and then that caused Con Edison to become quite concerned. And they shut off all the electric power uh, from about 39th Street or 48th Street, uh, 42nd Street down south through Manhattan. Uh, at the same time, you had a steam distribution system. Uh, steam came off of various uh, fossil fuel plants in lower Manhattan. Uh, and what is very significant about steam is, is 
that you have about 105 miles of the steam system in New York City, and, uh, and it operates in the transmission part of that system at about 400 PSI, uh, and it operates in the distribution part of that system at about 160 PSI, and the temperature is somewhere between 415 and 475 degrees Fahrenheit. So, so this is a bomb. When it gets cooled, you develop a bubble. That bubble starts to grow in the steam distribution system. And unless you shut it down, it has a possibility of exploding and creating additional problems. In fact, we saw explosions in the steam system in 2007 which occurred on 42nd Street. And these, of course, killed a person and completely disrupted the transportation system in New York City for a full day, having tremendous consequences. When these steam lines break, because they're at such high temperature, they are surrounded with a coating of asbestos. Asbestos is environmentally unfriendly. When you blow up one of these lines, the asbestos goes all over the adjacent buildings. And with a rainfall, it goes into the ventilation grates for the underground, for the subway system. And therefore, the stations have to be cleaned up by people with moon suits on. So quite significant. Uh, last thing I'm going to talk about in terms of catalysts for change, for real changes in policy and measures that we take to make resilience more lasting and powerful. I'll talk a little bit about the L-Line tunnel. Uh, the L-Line tunnel was about 100 and about 1.5 miles long under the East River. Uh, it was about 100 years old. It stretched uh, uh, the, the L-Line itself from First Avenue uh, in Manhattan to Bedford Station uh, in, in Brooklyn as it went underneath the river. If we are to look at the L-Line, you can see where it's crossing the East River. That's what we're gonna talk about. Uh, that was inundated uh, during Hurricane Sandy. It was brought back, but there was still a quick fix and residual salt that got into the uh, uh, track system, got into the instrumentation system uh, uh, for the signaling. Uh, and this was causing problems and delays with time it needed to be cleaned up. And you can see the L-Line takes us from 8th Avenue all the way over uh, on the east side of Manhattan uh, to Canarsie uh, in Brooklyn. It's often called the Canarsie Line or the Canarsie Tunnel. Uh, and uh, I know from working a lot in New York City with many of the utility companies, the best bagels in New York City are coming out of Canarsie. And uh, so therefore this was not only a problem uh, for transportation, but a culinary disaster at the same time. Now, in 2012, Hurricane Sandy filled this tunnel with salt water. We can take a look at this picture here. Uh, you can see that the uh, tunnel is full of water from inundation because of Hurricane Sandy for about 3,500 feet. Uh, and there was a renovation that was done from the First Avenue Station to the uh, Bedford Avenue Station. One of the difficulties and the challenges with respect to this renovation was the fact that the tunnel varied in diameter, but it was relatively small, between five and 15 and a half feet. So there wasn't a lot of room uh, to reorganize uh, some of the utilities that are, are a necessary part of the tunneling system. So you can see the variation in the tunnel diameters and in the kinds of lining that, that, that was actually used. You can see the, the level of inundation. Um, there is with each of these tunnels, a bench wall. And uh, you can see the bench wall on the lower parts of that transverse cross section through the tunnel. There's also a yellow uh, limiting line. And that line is to take into consideration is the dynamic profile. So when the train goes through the L-line uh, tunnel or the Canarsie tunnel, it rocks back and forth laterally. And so you have to draw a dynamic boundary for this and design for your features associated with the tunnel outside of that yellow boundary. So we can see that many of the cables are going in these uh, bench walls uh, and the bench walls themselves then uh, become uh, an important part of this whole process. 
Um, the bench walls at this particular location were affected by alkali silica reaction, which meant that they uh, were had imbibed water and were expanding, and there was some deterioration associated with these bench walls. So to fix the tunnels, you had to fix the bench walls, and much of the bench walls was planned to be removed by hand and by pneumatic drills and so forth, and that was a time-consuming process. Uh, as a consequence of this problem, uh, there was a special uh, review team created by professors from Columbia and professors from Cornell. Uh, you can see in this picture on the left, there's uh, Dean Mary Boyce uh, from Columbia. Um, Lance Collins was the dean from New York City. Uh, and there are three professors from Columbia and myself uh, from, uh, from Cornell with Lance Collins. And, uh, and they were to come up with an evaluation for what actually happened and maybe some changes associated with the fixing that would be uh, occurred. Um, the recommendations that were put forward by this group was to decouple the power cable housing from the bench wall. Instead of having the bench wall as the protector of the power cable, you were going to take the power cable out and you were going to jacket it with cables that are zero halogen fireproof material, just like that are used in the airline in the aerospace industry and that satisfy the National Fire Protection Association uh, 130 fire codes. So rather than casket them in these bench walls, they were taken out, they were put onto fiber reinforced racks. There was a lot of work to make sure that they all were gonna fit there. And that was a much better place to have them fireproofed and protected and away from being in the winch walls, which actually got in the way of trying to fix these cables because water came in through the cracks and the deteriorated portions. Uh, the next thing was to leave the bench walls where structurally stable, to fortify them with fiber reinforced polymers where one could do them and where they were really not going to be able to be fixed, re remove the unstable bench walls. Well, you can imagine the bench walls were a, a critical part of the critical path for this project. And uh, therefore, when fiber reinforced polymers were placed in, and there were three different castings in place, um, there was a, a opportunity to reinforce these bench walls and to reduce the bench walls, which were structurally unstable and had to be removed to a relatively small percentage. And this saved a lot with respect to the critical path and the time that was required uh, to fix the tunnels. Um, there was a smart fiber optic sensor cable, uh, cables that were also planned for the bench walls. Uh, and because there's an expansion associated with alkali silica reaction, these fiber optics were very sensitive to changes in volume and they were there to enhance the physical, manual, visual inspections which are created in these tunnels. In addition, uh, once a day, there is a high resolution LIDAR train that goes through each of these tunnels, which creates a point cloud of the geometry associated with the cross sections. And therefore you could use these LIDAR cloud points to determine the deformation of some of the uh, physical items in the tunnels, especially the bench walls, and use that to supplement the information you were getting from the smart fiber optic cable sensors. And this is just a picture of the fiber optics. You can literally, with the fiber optics, make a cable that can sense deformations uh, to the order of 10 to 30 micro strain over a length of several kilometers, which was actually done uh, as part of this tunnel system. Uh, this was not new technology. It had been done for the London Crossrail. Uh, the, the LIDAR had been done for the London bridges. Many European um, uh, locations uh, were uh, using fiber optics already. This was just important. There was recommendations to increase the tunnel resilience against flooding. There are um, doors now uh, that actually prevent the flooding of each of these tunnels. And there is, every time an inundation in New York, there is the need to cover uh, each of these in penetrations that occur. Over 2,300 openings in the flood zone that occurs with a category two hurricane. 
Um, you have mechanical closure devices, you have marine doors, you have water tight hatch doors and watertight manhole inserts. This is a tremendous change in terms of resilience, uh, recognition from Hurricane Sandy, and a, a movement or an application of this kind of protection to systems that are affected by hurricanes all over the United States and all over the world. There was also an enhancement of public safety. In other words, there was a detailed evaluation of control options for dust and airborne silica. When you do have to destroy or change a bench wall, it creates silica in the air. You cannot occupy that tunnel, not certainly by the public, uh, unless there is a control that you are not going to have a polluted environment. And so that uh, academic crew uh, actually recommended in an, in, uh, an independent environmental firm to monitor air quality and report directly uh, to the New York City transit system. All of this meant that no closure of service was necessary with the new design. The work could, could be completed with weekend and nighttime closures of one tube only at a time leaving the other one to run trains in both directions. That was a little longer, but there was always service. And during the work days, Monday through Friday, during the rush hours, there was always two tunnels operating. And, and what happened as a consequence was the L line did not have to be shut down. So 500,000 riders per day uh, could actually take this service and not be disrupted. This was having a tremendous effect on the real estate because before this, this, this tunnel was gonna be shut down for a year and a half. Um, with the fixes, it was never shut down and the job was finished three months early and it saved a hundred million dollars. So really quite successful. Uh, a major change that could be applied to other major infrastructure projects in New York, uh, such as the Gateway Project, which is now um, sort of set at about 13 or 11, 11 to 13 billion dollars uh, that's going to supply or provide an extra tunnel into Penn Station uh, for the Amtrak system and New, New Jersey train. So how then does this all affect us? Not only do we need to see patterns in, in reality that are associated with a punctuation of the equilibrium, that is a punctuation of resilience that's needed to change how we deal with these extreme events that are motivated by these extreme events. But we also need to take a look at how we might generate, punctuate ourselves, uh, additional resilience without having to wait for an extreme event to cause the catalysis of that type of system. So there is some infrastructure that's too big to fail. Uh, certainly the Japanese know that after the failure of the nuclear power plants, um, uh, after the Tohoku earthquake. Uh, and, and therefore there is a need to reassess the risk related to some of our critical infrastructure uh, and actually to reassess and identify what is actually critical. What is too big to fail, just like the banks some stuff can't go and you have to really develop special measures for that. So one way to borrow from the change in resilience associated with extreme events like those with the hurricanes or the earthquakes is to create local coalitions. All infrastructure is local, all infrastructure is universal. The, the difficulty is that it has universal laws that control how it behaves but it has local advocates and users uh, that actually define the social dimensions. So um, we need coalitions to protect critical infrastructure that's too big to fail. And that is a punctuation that we can introduce that would accelerate uh, resilience in the built environment. And one of the ways in which this is done is in Southern California. Southern California is like the 11th or 10th largest economy in the world. Um, it gets its water from the California aqueduct, from the Los Angeles aqueducts number one and two, and the Colorado River aqueduct. And it also gets about 30% uh, of water from, the, uh, from groundwater, but a major earthquake on the San Andreas Fault would cut off all of these aqueducts and a study 
that has been recently performed shows that the restoration of that water for various parts of the system, for example, the California aqueduct might break in multiple locations. Um, it might take up to a year and a half to two years to restore that system. That's really quite significant. And so there has been a local advocacy group called the Seismic Resilience Water Supply Task Force that consists of the California Department of Water Resources, CADWR, that operates the aqueduct at about 49 billion cubic meters per year. That's due to, uh, that's forecast to rupture in 15 different places, maybe take a year and a half to two years to restore. The Los Angeles aqueducts, we have a picture on the right of the Lake Elizabeth Tunnel that actually goes right across the San Andreas Fault. And, and during a major earthquake of the San Andreas Fault, we expect that this tunnel will be offset by uh, a, an order of 10 or more feet along that fault rupture section. And therefore it would have to be reconstructed on the fly in order to be able to bring water into the Southern California area. Also the Colorado River Aqueduct is subject to multiple fault ruptures, some of which involve uplift. So we get about four meters, uh, about 12 feet or so of, of uplift, and that has tremendous impacts on the pump stations. So this seismic resilience water supply task force is very important. If we just do basic game theory, um, you have six permutations. Either the Department of Water Resources or LADWP or MWP individually would want to fix things or combinations of two would want to fix things, but neither of those combinations would work all three have to be part of the regional uh, situation because the constituencies for the other um, wouldn't agree necessarily to undertaking it without everyone institutionally involved in the water being part of the solution process. So even as you start, you're down to about a one out of six chance of operating, getting all these people to operate, and then there's a reduction in the probability from there associated with problems getting all these things to happen. Fortunately, we have this supply task force. It, it actually met for the first time in 2016, has been meeting uh, ever since, and uh, there's leadership being taken by a number of organizations that is helping to make uh, the water resources and water infrastructure in Southern California more robust. We're going to take this picture from Wall Street and William Street and we'll fade it one more time. Uh, I'll put on some lessons for resilient infrastructure and only going to focus on one. And this is innovation through integration. Uh, a lot of people asked when we took the lessons from Hurricane Sandy and, uh, and we improved the construction of the L-Line. Notice that they were still doing renovation in the L-Line uh, in 2019, 2020, which is when they finished um, reconstructing uh, the L-Line or the uh, Canarsie tunnels. Um, that's, that's, that's another seven or eight years on top of the 2012 when the actual hurricane occurred. So these, these repairs have a long, long tail associated with the repair situation. And people said, well, how did you do it? And, and we said, we didn't innovate on anything necessarily. That, that just like your phone, your phone operates because it has a innovative uh, email. It has an innovative camera system. It has an innovative uh, GPS system. And our solutions also, none of the individuals hadn't been used before in an innovative and successful way, but it was the combination of these solutions, the entire, um, solution that was given by the academic group, this integration of innovation, which, which changed things. And it's my hope that this innovation through integration will become a major part of the thought process, harnessing some of the um, computer technologies that we have uh, to be able to innovate better and to build back better uh, when we restore infrastructure 
um, associated with the damage from these extreme events. So um, we have natural changes and we have person motivated changes like the special group, uh, advocacy group in Southern California, uh, which are creating a punctuated resilience that hopefully uh, will pick up in terms of speed and will lead us to a more resilient infrastructure. And then as a parting comment, I'd like to say that uh, I was had the opportunity to be uh, uh, the uh, editor of a special um, edition of The Bridge, which is the National Academy of Engineering flagship publication. And you can go uh, to the website, you can just uh, Google The Bridge and uh, go right onto it and you can download uh, the entire publication, uh, which is meant to be a, a summary of what we are doing insofar as resilient infrastructure is concerned. Okay, I think that's, that's pretty much it for me and I'm going to uh, stop sharing my screen at this particular location. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Professor um, O'Rourke. So let's see, here I see in the chat already some questions. Let's see, probably this is for Professor Wills. <clears throat> So how does punctuate, punctuate the equilibrium treat plate tectonics influence and effect on a species change and evolution? Yeah, that's a good point. Um, uh, the, the question is quite right that, uh, that, that uh, plate tecton tectonics have had a huge impact on the history of life on the planet. <coughs> and um, of course, the tectonic process itself is generally quite slow, but it, of course it produces massive earthquakes, uh, upheavals, uh, uh, areas that have high volcanism and so on. So uh, there are going to be times at which te tectonics really do have at least local uh, widespread uh, dramatic effects on the environment. And that is being worked into the uh, our understanding of the fossil record. Um, it certainly is one of the major sources of these large changes, but I think you could see from the look that we gave uh, at the, um, the bivalves, the, uh, the um, marine bivalve records, it's surprising to see how all this time evolution has been tooling along um, replacing old species, uh, 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 adding species, changing the overall rate of, of uh, species evolution. Um, it's sort of, you can think of the, the punctuation points as, uh, points as being sort of um, negative effects on evolution. But Darwinian evolution is able to overcome these negative effects and to build back better, if you like, to come back with all signs of new adaptations and new species um, that can really uh, uh, make the whole process extremely dynamic. Okay, I think this is another question. And I think this is also for Professor Wills. How do you distinguish correlation from causation? What are the specific extinction events? Did dinosaurs go extinct at one impact point in time, or did the mammals eat mm -hmm. their eggs and end reproduction? Thank goodness. <laughs> yes, well, we're all glad the dinosaurs aren't here still, um, but it's complicated, of course. The majority of the, of the lineages of dinosaurs that existed 66 million years ago went extinct as a direct result of the impact event and the things that happened to the climate and so on. Um, dinosaurs were going extinct all the way up to that point. The dinosaurs of the, um, uh, of the, uh, the Cretaceous were really quite different uh, from the dinosaurs of Jurassic. Lots and lots of dinosaurs had changed over during those, the, that long, long period of time. So dinosaurs were dynamic. Uh, it's just that this big impact had a huge effect. And um, there were lots <clears throat> of mammals back then. We tend to forget the mammals have been around much longer than 
they didn't suddenly appear when the dinosaurs went extinct. The mammals would have been around just about as long as the dinosaurs. And they diverged as the dinosaurs did. There are something like two thirds as many different uh, genera of mammals, uh, groups of species of mammals that are known in the time of dinosaurs as there were groups of dinosaurs, about uh, two thirds as many. And those are the ones we know about. Many of them are very small and so they don't leave good fossils, but uh, there's a lot going on in mammalian evolution too. Okay, what are the oldest fossil records available? What's missing? Where did they go? <laughs> well, the <laughs> oldest fossil records that we have go back to before uh, the the so-called Cambrian explosion, the very beginning of the Paleozoic, when all kinds of groups of large uh, animals appeared in the fossil record for the first time. But before that time, there were also groups of mammals, uh, groups of animals uh, that are very mysterious. Some of them don't look the least bit like anything we know today. And these so-called pre-Cambrian organisms seem all pretty much all to have gone extinct. Possibly some of them may have survived. We do know that the sponges appeared that far back and the sponges have left a good fossil record even throughout the Cambrian explosion. So before that, you get back to the point where apparently there wasn't enough oxygen in the atmosphere to allow organisms to get really big. And so any fossils that were left behind were small and easily destroyed, easily lost. All right. Uh, I think this is for, Professor, for Professor O'Rourke. How does quotation mark nature to be commanded must be obeyed quotation mark fit into resilience? Is it presumed that resilience means engineering your way out of obeying nature? For example, what about the recent reimposition of Summers Lake in British Columbia following an atmospheric river storm? Um, what we're trying to do with, uh, with resilience is, is literally make adjustments to what we anticipate would be natural acts. Uh, the, the atmospheric uh, river in, in British Columbia is regenerating a lake because the, the water has no place to go but to collect in, in some of these lakes. That's uh, literally going to create flooding and so forth for people and so on. And so um, punctuated resilience would be a, a activity that's generated uh, to try to control that runoff. Uh, to provide for it, uh, and, and per, per, perhaps in terms of engineering, make it better and so forth. I, I'd like to say that um, much of the resilience associated with a, a lot of these uh, groups uh, that are, or cities and, and towns that we see uh, are not just the, the, the physical attributes. So, so oftentimes people tend to think of, of, of resilience as, a, as an engineering activity. But there's really quite a lot of social aspects related to resilience. And there is an incredible amount of dovetailing that's required in terms of creating policies that make sense from an engineering point of view, but are acceptable to the societies and the communities uh, from the other angle too. There, there's also a whole process of green infrastructure where you are going to protect the environment, such as, for example, with uh, wetlands and so forth in, in hurricane prone areas of, of uh, southern Louisiana, uh, of Jamaica Bay uh, in New York City, that will uh, absorb some of the um, surge uh, and therefore will reduce the actual amount of water that has to be engineered for it. All right, so there is another one. I think also this is for Professor O'Rourke. Aqueduct tape. Couldn't the maximum potential fault offsets be determined in advance and the restoration plan requirements be prepositioned prior to an earthquake event? What the total solution, if you close off the New York tunnels from flooding, the water will rise higher in surrounding buildings. 
how do you know you've won? Number one, if you close off the tunnels in terms of volume, they are large in terms of absolute, but relative to the sea surge, they're very small. So um, there's not really a big displacement or an increase in the surge associated with protecting the tunnels. And the tunnels for many of these cities, um, particularly for New York, uh, there, there, there's so many tunnels that connect with the uh, Manhattan portion of New York City that, uh, that, that one of the great lessons of Hurricane Sandy was the enormity of this particular problem. The, the long restoration time that's required to fix all these tunnels once they get flooded. And then the, the, the problems that are superimposed on that to create doors. So for example, if, if, if you're gonna do the, take the Midtown Tunnel, you'll see these, these hurricane doors right now. And if there's a hurricane coming, those doors are gonna be closed. And, uh, and therefore, when there is the hurricane, nobody's gonna go in that Midtown Tunnel, and, but that Midtown Tunnel is gonna be protected against being inundated. Uh, and as a consequence, it's going to be in much better shape to be restored after the event. And, and that's, that's a tremendous improvement in terms of what we have now. All right. So uh, I think also this is for Professor O'Rourke. Would you elaborate on the properties of the fiber and what is made of compressive strength modulus of elasticity Tensile strength, what material is it used with? Is it concrete? So the fiber reinforced reinforcements for the bench wall were kind of L-shaped uh, precast units. I don't know what their tensile strength is, and I don't know the composition. I do know this. I can I can I can put this into perspective for you. Um, Fiber reinforced composites used to be state of the art. Uh, they are no longer state of the art. They are an advanced practice. So about 10 years ago, they started being used in large measure to reinforce decking various facilities with respect to bridges. Um, so what we were doing with the L-line tunnel was just bringing a standard technology that had been pretty well developed and placing it underground. It's true that it hadn't been used a lot underground. It had been used mostly above ground. I think the, the experience that the uh, MTA had with using these precast units was tremendous. They, they're, they're great advocates of the fiber reinforced technology process. And, and part of the success was to precast them into shapes that fit into the repair so that you didn't have to um, customize every time you were gonna do a repair. And this precasting in the three basic shapes and the application of those and then the supplement of that stuff uh, really increased the amount of time uh, or, or decreased the amount of time and increased the efficiency associated with the process. It was a great success. All right, thank you, Professor O'Rourke. Is there any other question? If you have any question, please raise your hand click on reactions at the bottom of your screen, and then you will see the option raise hand. Do that and you can state your question or comment. Okay, here I see a new message. Uh, what? Did the cross through normal bell curve mean? Well, it's it's the new normal, right? It's the the there is nothing like normal probabilities. I've I've always said that that one of the great contributions of twentieth and twenty first century engineering has been the reduction of risk and the probability of of certain events occurring. Uh, and when we look at a probability distribution, it's rarely normal. It's, it's, it's generally skewed. And there's a long tail, let's say, to the hurricane events that, that might occur in a particular location. And it's the, really the tail that, that generates these extreme events that if they do occur, 
um, they take out infrastructure that might be too big to, to be lost. So we can take a lot of confidence and, uh, and a lot of, of, of meaning uh, and self-proclamation out, out of the sense that we understand the probability curves for the central 95%. But I think there's a certain amount of arrogance associated with believing you know the probability distributions in the tails. And when you take the knowledge of risk and probability distribution that we have gotten and we're able to use very effectively, and you expand that to the tails of some of these extreme probability distributions, I think there's the possibility of making some significant mistakes. And therefore, there is an engineering that rather than to define the main event or the worst event that can occur, there is the process of, of re-examining and doing a fix of the infrastructure that, that is an add-on to the probabilistic approach. So let me give you an example. When we take a look at the Fukushima plant that uh, during the Tohoku earthquake, was destroyed. Um, the actual problem occurred because the diesel pumps um, were destroyed in the basements of the facilities. Those pumps were necessary to go through the boiling water reactor so they would cool the reactor off. And as a consequence of not having flow through water, the reactor overheated and you got this meltdown that occurred in four of the particular units, actually three of the units and then the other one blew up. You could have taken those pumps out of there rather than the design on an extreme event. You could have just done the commonsensical thing and take these pumps from a low elevation to a high elevation that wasn't gonna be hit by the water. And in fact, they did that in units number four and six, which were down for repairs at the time, they were still functional entirely because their diesel units were at high elevation where you didn't have a splash or you didn't have any inundation from the water. Okay, so there is a follow-up question. Uh, so they are, are they precast concrete elements reinforced with steel bars? So the, the, the tunnels that we find in the L-line were the best of the 19-teens and 1920s technology. And that means very rapidly you get into cast iron. So these tunnel linings were cast iron segments. The cast iron segments were assembled under compressed air. You had to be under compressed air when you were in the East River soft sediments. Uh, and they were assembled and then concrete was poured into the, um, uh, for about an inch or two uh, on top of the uh, cast iron segments to provide a concrete coating on the inside. All right. So is there any other question or comment? Okay, there are here, let me check. Uh, uh, who, oh, yeah, yeah, okay. Hello, Ting. Hi, Ting. Professor Horak. So nice to see you again. Nice Thank to you see for, you. Well, always enlightening uh, lecture. So, what is your vision for the future of punctuated resilience enabled by advanced technologies? Let's say from the range of hazards from earthquakes uh, when to, I guess, in the changing climate. Well, I, th I think it's a real, real important um, branch of engineering now, or, and I wouldn't say engineering, a branch of sociology and engineering, because when you build infrastructure, you not only need engineers, you need planners. And the, the planning part of, of, of infrastructure is a necessary way to build infrastructure. And the engineering is a necessary way, but unless you have both, you, you really don't get it right. So that's, that's the first fundamental. The, the second is that as we go forward and uh, we develop the infrastructure of the future, what these extreme events have done is they've said, we have to design for extreme events. My experience always in California has been that uh, the tiebreaker is seismic. 
Uh, I've worked on the water supply of, of Los Angeles, of, of San Francisco, of, of Seattle, and, and always these hierarchical programs that are put into place where money is spent over a long period of time to mitigate the effects of earthquakes, it, it, it's predicated on the seismic issues. They, they are the tiebreakers. You, you have the issue, well, we're supplying enough water, um, uh, do we have enough pressure and so on and so forth, but the earthquakes really break the ties and they make, make it work. Same thing now with the, the, the tunnels and the systems in New York City and the East Coast. But rather than earthquakes, it happens to be hurricanes. Um, the, 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 we are working right now on the rehabilitation of what's called the North River Tunnels and the East River Tunnels, which is where Amtrak and New Jersey Transit uh, transport comes across the, the rivers, the East River and the, and the Hudson River, or the North Tunnels. And, uh, and they have to be designed so that they are hurricane proof because people can't go through that inundation again. We've already learned that lesson. So, so one, of the, one of the offtakes is that we used to regard extreme events as a rare event, that anything that I showed from 2004 to 2014 or in 2017 or even in 2020, 21, used to be regarded as a one in 20 year event now they're occurring almost every year. In fact, they are occurring every year. So you just have to deal with them. And therefore that's a great example of punctuated equilibrium in, or punctuated resilience in the sense that those disasters are affecting communities with the constant need to make things better. Great. All right, so we have now in, in us Abu, Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Thank you for this wonderful lecture. My question, do you use carbonated fiber reinforcement in your designs? No, the, 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 the um, fiber reinforced materials that were used both for the racks and for the um, strengthening of, of, of the bench walls uh, had, uh, I believe, a glass fiber associated with it. Um, I've worked with both fibers. Um, one of my problems with the carbon fibers is when you're, so we've used them with respect to protecting and making pipelines stronger. And so if you put a, a carbon fiber wrap on a pipeline, you have to be able to um, insulate the carbon wrap from the metal of the pipe, otherwise you end up with a battery. And uh, there's an electromotive force which then causes localized corrosion. So you, you need to be a little bit careful about the carbon. But there's no question about it. If you use carbon, it's very strong. They could get adequate strength out of the glass and that's a lot cheaper. Okay. <clears throat> Any other questions or comments? Thank you very much. What oh, about pleasure. the hydraulic? The hydraulic splitter. The, hydra the hydraulic rock splitters. Um, there was. That, there were, I, I know. I know what you mean. Uh, there weren't any hydraulic rock splitters that were used that I know of, because these were tunnels in soil. In soil. Okay. Thank you very much. I mean, there was pneumatic equipment that was originally designed to take out bad bench walls. But part of the beauty of rethinking the construction process was, do these bench walls need to come out? And if we reinforce them with fiber reinforced composites, can we cut down on the amount of bench walls that have to be taken completely out of the system, which is a very laborious and difficult process of, of hydraulic jackhammering away this concrete. And that's in fact what was done. And, and that's really, most of the, so to tell you the truth, that's, that's the, one of the big, big secrets, right? Once you were willing or were able to take the breaking down of the bench walls, the critical path, the critical path started to get much, much better. And you could do the repairs you needed to do and still keep the tunnels open. We spent a lot of time on critical path and on the, uh, uh, the actual um, uh, schedule of the work. I was very concerned about that. 
Thank you very much, and it's nice to see you again. Thank you very nice much. Nice to see you. All right. Any other question or comments? <clears throat> okay. So if not, Professor Wills, Professor O'Rourke, thank you. Thank you very much for your time and for making these, present these presentations. And to all of you, thank you, thank you very much for participating, attending in this event. Please stay tuned for our uh, next events next year. And uh, have a very, very wonderful and very safe uh, holidays. Thank you. <laughs>